machine learning has made its mark in several application areas some of which are very impactful others which are very very entertaining however given the diversity of these areas it is natural to wonder is there a separate machine learning technique required to solve the problems in each of these areas fortunately that is not the case there do exist a small set of very simple and basic machine learning techniques which when creatively mixed and match can help us solve surprisingly complex problems today we will take a look at some of these machine learning primitives my beautiful friends this is cs771 introduction to machine learning and let's get started in our last discussion we saw that there are certain tasks for which it is difficult to directly write code to solve those tasks such as recommendation for these tasks it's instead common to use machine learning techniques by first collecting a lot of training data and then using a machine learning algorithm to take that training data and generate a machine learning model that can solve that task we saw that the process of taking training data and converting it to a model is called training and the process of taking new unseen users and making predictions on them is called testing now most of the popular machine learning primitives can be obtained by looking at three things what sort of action do we want to take on a new test data point second in what form is training data available to us and third what is the sort of model that we learn and how do we learn it the simplest of all machine learning primitives allows us to answer yes no questions another way of looking at it is to think of there being these two bins such that each data point must be put either in the left bin or the right bin in this example our data points are emails and the left bin is supposed to contain all the spam emails and the right one is supposed to contain all the non spam emails these two bins are often called the two classes into which we are classifying the data points note that the exact classification does not matter since that will depend on the taste of the individual user the more important point here is that every email must get classified into exactly one bin also note that this is not the only binary classification problem we can solve on this data we could have just as well created other pairs of bins to solve other binary classification problems for example we could have classified emails into those that make the user happy versus those that make the user stressed this could cause a different arrangement of the emails into the two bins as we see here but that would still constitute a perfectly valid binary classification step now in case we find two classes to be a bit restrictive for our application then there is also this other machine learning primitive that allows us to answer multiple choice questions this is easily done by increasing the number of bins it's as simple as that this machine learning primitive is called multi class classification to see a nice example of this we turn to the popular email application google mail or gmail which categorizes each incoming mail into one of five categories the number of classes in this case would be 5 and every email must go into exactly one of the five categories now if we wish to truly send an email to more than one bin if our application really demands so then it is possible but in that case it would be better to frame the problem as a labeling or a tagging problem rather than a classification problem So instead of having a set of bins and a strict rule that each data point must go into exactly one bin we should instead define a set of tags or labels and allow data points to be tagged with zero or more of these tags or labels 
It is worthwhile repeating the earlier observation that it is totally up to us as to what we want the tags or classes to be. However, we must also bear in mind that machine learning algorithms need training data. So we must be prepared to show the machine learning algorithm examples of emails classified into the set of classes that we have defined or else tagged with the set of labels that we have defined. Another subtle point to keep in mind is that we are implicitly assuming here that although the set of classes or tags can be whatever we want them to be, they don't change over time. Specifically, we assume that we will not suddenly encounter a tag or a class during testing that we have not previously seen during training as well. This, however, is not a very strict assumption and there exist techniques called zero-shot learning techniques that do allow us to keep adding new classes or new tags during testing as well. However, that is a discussion for another day. For now, we instead move on to another very important machine learning primitive called regression. Regression is the machine learning primitive that allows us to assign a score to each data point. The score is just a number and can be an integer, a fraction, it could be positive or negative or zero. For example, in this application, we are trying to assign a real valued score to each email to judge its spamminess. We want spam emails to have a score closer to five and regular emails to have a score closer to zero. And we see here that friend request email is getting a slightly higher score. The scam email is getting a very high score and genuine emails are getting low spam scores. This is often called real valued regression. And you might be wondering at this point, didn't we just solve spam detection earlier as a binary classification problem? Well, here is the beauty of machine learning. For most real life problems, there will usually exist more than one way to solve it using machine learning techniques. There would be different ways of applying different machine learning primitives, mix them and match them very innovatively to create new applications. At this point, it would be good to recall that machine learning is as much an art as it is a science and selecting the right primitive, the most suitable primitive for an application brings out the artistic side of machine learning. Also note that solving spam detection as a regression problem allows us to give a more refined answer to the question, is this email a spam email than a simple yes or no. As with classification, it really depends on you what you want the score to mean. Instead of the score being a estimate of the spamminess of the email, we could instead use the score to predict the urgency with which we must check that email. So a score of zero would indicate an email that we can read maybe later. And a score of five would be an extremely urgent email that requires our attention right away. Of course, we are also free to change the scale of the scores. So instead of going from zero to five, they could just as well go from one to 10. Of course, the Scores assigned to these emails would also change if we change the application as well as the scale of the scores. However, just as before, whatever meaning we assign to the score, and whatever range we choose for the scores, we are responsible for collecting training data accordingly. Note that it would simply not work if we wish to predict the urgency of an email at test time, but feed in spam scores as training data. What restrictions we put on the set of scores really depends on the application that we are trying to solve using regression. For example, if we want to use regression to predict the age of a customer who has visited our website, then it would be good to restrict the scores to be within a reasonable positive range, say between zero and hundred, since negative scores would not make sense for this application. At this point, I would like you to take a break and recall the exercise we had done last time where you had Propose an activity that you do daily, but which you would find difficult to solve using a piece of code. 
I would like you to think of one or more ways in which the machine learning primitives we have just discussed could solve the problem. To help you with this exercise, let us take a few mini case studies to understand how applications can be solved using these machine learning primitives. Let's start with our favorite problem of recommendation. A user has come to our website and we wish to figure out which fruits they would like to purchase. The first and possibly the most obvious way of solving this problem would be via multi-label classification. We could treat the set of all possible fruits that are on sale on this website as a set of possible labels or tags. Each user would be a data point waiting to be tagged with the fruits they like. Now you would immediately notice that this means that the set of labels might become very large, especially if you replace the store example of fruits with, let's say, the products being sold on a large e-commerce website like Amazon or Flipkart. Nevertheless, this will get the job done. Never mind what is the number of labels being involved. However, there's a completely different way of solving this problem, which is also very useful, this time via regression. So this time, instead of a user being a data point, a user fruit pair will be a data point. So for every user and fruit pair, we will want to assign a real valued score, let's say between zero and five, which would indicate how much that user likes that fruit. So if the user likes that fruit very much, we would assign it a very high score. Whereas if the user doesn't like that fruit very much, we would assign it a low score. So in this particular example, we know for a fact that this gentleman likes oranges. So the pair of this user with the fruit orange gets a very high score. We know that this user likes watermelons and strawberries somewhat. So the pairing of this user with the fruit watermelon and the fruit strawberry gets a moderate score. We know this user does not like grapes. So the pairing of this user with the grapefruit doesn't get a very high score. Can you think of any other techniques, any other machine learning primitives that we saw that can be used to solve this problem? What about binary classification? Could that be a way to solve this problem? Think about it. The second case study I would like to take is that of machine translation. So in this case, the problem would often be solved even in practice via the primitive of multi-class classification. Here is where what we define as a data point and what we define as a label comes into picture. So the key insight here is to treat each word in the target language, in this case Marathi, as a class. We may also want to throw in words such as Melbo, which are not really Marathi words, but which do appear in the source sentence, just so that they help in translation. Once again, you might notice that the number of classes will be very, very large because it would be the size of the dictionary of the Marathi language. And yes, this would be a trend. Many modern machine learning applications, especially web scale ones, involve classes or labels that range in the millions. But never mind about that for now. The way we might solve this problem is to first create a data point out of the source sentence, in this case, the English sentence, and just try to predict the first word of the Marathi sentence correctly. Now, we change the data point to not be just the English sentence, but be the English sentence and the first Marathi word that we have predicted already. And the goal would be to now predict the second word in the Marathi sentence correctly. Notice this is also a multi-class problem because we are only trying to predict one of the many, many words in Marathi. And then we can go on and on. We can keep adding the words we have successfully predicted till now to the data point and keep on predicting the next words. At this point, I would like you to take another break and really think about how you might use the machine learning primitives that we have seen to solve some of the other applications that we saw at the very beginning of this video. Now be warned, some of these are very complex problems and a single primitive might not be 
enough to solve these problems completely. Several primitives might be required to be used in conjunction to get a very good solution. However, that should not prevent you from trying. Because the goal here is not to solve the problem completely, but to start building intuition as to how to take an application and think about the machine learning primitives that can be used to solve that application. We now move on to the machine learning primitives that we get by way of changing the way in which the training data is available to us. The most straightforward of this primitive we have already seen and it's something called supervised learning. In this, we get training data which we use to learn a machine learning model using the machine learning algorithm. And at test time, we get a bunch of test data points on which we make predictions, hopefully correctly. However, there exist several variations of these and we will look at some of them. A common variant of supervised learning is something called semi-supervised learning, where the training data that we receive is not completely labeled. So for example, in this case, for one of the users, we don't know which products they have purchased, perhaps because uh, they have not purchased any products on our website yet. Now you might wonder why are such data points even kept in the training data? Shouldn't we just throw them away? Well, not quite. Even unlabeled data can be very valuable in improving the model using techniques that we will see as a part of this course later. And in fact, semi-supervised learning is actually a member of a much broader class of methods used for learning known as learning with weak supervision. Another interesting and very popular machine learning primitive is obtained in the setting where the training data is not given to us in one go. So in this setting, which is known as online learning, we first take some pre-trained models. Someone else has trained a model and given it to us, but it might not be a very good model. So we still need to train it. We still need to improve it. So what happens is that a user comes and we make predictions on that user using this pre-trained model, but our predictions might not be very good. So the user actually tells us what fruits they like and then this user becomes a part of the training set on which we learn and improve the model. Then another user comes along and we again make predictions on that user which may still not completely align with the user's interests but this user again forms a part of our training data using which we can further improve the model. And this process continues. Now you would have noticed that in this setting of online learning, there is no clear distinction between training and test points. Data points come and we treat them as test data points, but once we have done prediction on them, they become training points for us and the process continues. In a way, this is very valuable because it promotes continuous learning. The learning never stops. Now I'd like to uh, exercise a word of caution here. Uh, you should not get confused by the name. There are several other variants of machine learning primitives which we have not looked at here, such as active learning and reinforcement learning. We will look at them in due course of time. Lastly, let's take a look at the machine learning primitives that we get by the various types of models that we can learn. The first kind of models that we will study in this course are what can be called geometric models. These include support vector machines and ridge regression. These perform classifications by learning laws that look like geometric shapes. For example, we could take data points such as emails, convert them into vectors, and then use, let's say, a line or a hyperplane to separate spam emails from non-spam emails. Or we could use some other geometric object to separate spam emails from non-spam emails. The second kind of machine learning models that we will study, which are a close cousin of geometric models, are neural models. These are the models that constitute deep learning and include multilayer perceptrons, convolutional networks, and transformers. We will also study a very interesting class of models known as probabilistic models that learn probabilistic laws that govern the data. Uh, lastly, we will also look at a very interesting class of models that have memory. These include learning with prototypes, k-nearest neighbors, and decision trees. 
So to wrap up, today we saw that machine learning tasks are usually solved not as a one-off but by creatively composing simple primitives. These primitives allow us to perform several tasks such as classification, regression, recommendation and they allow us to perform machine learning in a variety of settings such as supervised, weekly supervised, online, reinforcement and the like. They also allow us to use a variety of models to encode the laws and patterns that we observe in the data such as geometric models or neural models or probabilistic models. Finally, we saw that machine learning primitives can be mixed and matched to create innovative solutions. So I think this is a good place to stop for today. Stay curious and I'll see you next time.